Can we come to you next, please, Stephen? So rather than cover the areas of sorting out management, compliance, um, that type of thing, I want to mainly focus on some of the ways to make your venture successful that I learned from running my own law firm for 12 years. Uh, obviously, as people have mentioned, the most important thing is clients. If, if you set up a firm like I did with no client following, the most important consideration is how are you going to get clients through the door? So for myself, having worked in claimant and defendant personal injury, I decided to set up my own personal injury firm. Um, but I knew I couldn't compete with the large regional firms and certainly not the large national firms. So again, that main challenge was how do I get people through the door? I realized I had to offer something different and be more focused on the local community. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how my experience was when I was involved in an accident and my insurance company appointed a lawyer for me over 200 miles away, which was very handy. Um, obviously, I never saw the person dealing with my case. I very rarely was able to speak to them. Uh, and I more often than not get someone who knew absolutely nothing about my case. So the whole process felt like I was on a production line and I was a number, not a person. So using that experience and analyzing how I and others felt when in this situation, I, I determined that my unique selling point was gonna to be to provide a more personalized service and incorporated that into my business plan to secure some funding from the bank. Um, this was back in the days when the banks actually gave me quite a nice sum of money without uh, any security, which I was quite surprised about, but, but there you go. Um, so my USP, um, really I had to determine how I went about delivering this more personalized service. The first and most important thing was that a client had to be able to speak to the person dealing with their case the majority of the time that they contacted the office. So, and on the odd occasion that the main case handler wasn't available, there would be a secondary contact that the client would be aware of right from the outset of their case. So if neither of those people were available, a client would be called back within two hours of the call as well, which I thought was important. So client communications clearly had to be compliant with all the various requirements uh, that were applicable, but could be put in more clearer and straightforward language. So I spent a lot of time ensuring letters were clear, easy to understand. And I asked clients specifically how clear communications were and what I could do to improve, improve them. So with the feedback from actual clients, I actually changed the letters over time. So part of the service was to continually improve by listening to clients and therefore every client received a feedback form at the conclusion of the case, which was very important. Uh, you always have to put yourself in the shoes of the client who perhaps in, in my business hadn't had an accident ever before uh, and is really relying on the lawyer to guide them through the process. So now that I had a plan to, yeah, as to how I would deliver this great service, how could I actually let potential clients know I was there to help them? Um, so one of the big, the big issues was, was advertising and getting the message out there. So again, couldn't compete with, compete with large firms. I didn't have, simply didn't have the budget. Uh, so keeping things local was the obvious strategy. So I decided I was actually going to focus on a, a radius of 15 miles from my office, one five miles, so not very, not very large at all. Uh, so in relation to advertising, the first step was a decent website. But back in 2004, when I set up, it was surprising how poor a lot of law firm websites were back then. Um, again, just made it very easy to understand and for clients to get some information rather than just telling people about me and about the firm, which, which is quite boring. Um, I also advertised via my local radio station, which was expensive, but, but at the time was worth trying. Um, but given the limited budget and my local focus, I also tried advertising in a local free magazine they used to come through the door every month. And it's the type of thing that I kept handy because it had numbers for plumbers, electricians, that type of thing. So I thought, well, if I keep it for, hand, for times that I need numbers, then other people will as well. And so on top of the, the paid advertising, um, I also identified some ways of getting some free advertising by writing articles for local magazines. Uh, and I focused these on consumer issues that people might find useful. I also joined the local business networking group, which actually generated quite a lot of work as well. And all of this together with setting up IT, telephones, everything like that, the funds were going down very, very quickly, um, which, is, which is a common trait when you set up a new business. So, but the most important tip I'm give about advertising, because it can be quite expensive, is really carefully monitor where your clients find you. Uh, Cause that way you can actually see what works, what doesn't work, 
and then you can focus your budget on the areas that do. And surprisingly for me, the, the, the most effective advertising was actually the little free local magazine um, that actually generated the most inquiries and clients out of everything. And that was probably the cheapest thing as well. I mean, the second most important tip is, is when you are in the business is really negotiate with advertisers. Don't take the first price. Um, they offer absolutely not. Um, and also think of ways you can help them and yourself. For example, in, in the local free magazine, I actually doubled my exposure in that by writing an article each month on consumer issues, which meant I actually had three pages in the magazine uh, for the same price as, as just as, as one for the advert. Um, and the final thing I did on advertising was given something back to the community. I always offered a free 30 minute consultation for general consumer matters. And the time spent was paid back tenfold, really, because the number of clients who later then came and instructed me on something that would actually generate some income was quite surprising. Um, the next thing in advertising was really um, television and newspapers. Obviously, I couldn't afford TV advertising, so it wasn't that type of, of, of television. But some of the best advertising I had for the firm was, was actually appearing on national news and in national and local papers. Um, the two most heavily featured matters I dealt with were um, an assault by the police on, on my client, uh, David Healer, who I'm allowed to say because it was in the public domain and he was on TV. He was assaulted in a custody suite at a police station by a custody sergeant, and it was all captured on video, and the custody sergeant was actually charged and convicted of common assault. And so uh, the, the scary thing in, in this case was actually at the time of this assault, my client was actually having an angina attack and could have ended up just collapsing on the floor and, and, and dying and being one of these statistics. So the client was getting quite a lot of interest from the press and asked me to handle that for him. Uh, so with his consent, obviously, I, I took the opportunity to do that. And he agreed that we could try and generate some debate around deaths in custody. So I managed to secure the attendance after the court appearance of the custody sergeant of Sky, BBC, ITV, uh, and did the your typical lawyer on the st steps of the court doing a doing a sort of statement uh, and I also because of the human interest angle I contacted Channel 4 News and actually got my client an exclusive interview on Channel 4 News because they're very into the the human angle of stories and I thought this would be right up their street so that publicity which was completely free uh, obviously generated a lot of interest in relation to claims against the police which was quite interesting um, and the other matter that I got widely reported was when myself and a number of clients appeared on on BBC Inside Out uh, we exposed Durham County Council because uh, they were fraudulently altering uh, highways inspection records to help them defend claims when people fell over on a, a broken paving stone. Um, again, that generated lots and lots of inquiries in relation to highway tripping claims. Uh, and obviously that type of free advertising would cost well, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, and obviously nowhere a small firm could afford anything like that, but you can quite easily obtain it if you've just got the ability to briefly explain in an email or telephone call to a, a news outlet, the sort of human interest element of it. Um, and the lesson that I learned and, and the lesson for any business is if you've got an interesting story, an interesting case with a human angle, get in touch with print media, television media. Don't be afraid to do it. Um, try to identify the most appropriate outlet based on the issues, because um, obviously like I said, with the police assault thing, I knew Channel 4 News did that type of thing quite often, you know, sort of human interest type things. And I would always keep one eye on your interest in cases uh, that could help you do that. And obviously, you know, the next challenge after that is then getting the clients to, to agree to it, which is, is, is usually quite easy because usually they're quite um, upset at what's going on as well. So the next thing I want to mention was, was obviously staff, which obviously the most important thing after you're you've got the clients is to have obviously dedicated hard work and staff to actually deliver the service you want. Um, again, I couldn't compete with the bigger firms for salary. So I had to ensure that what I did offer, the staff had some value to sort of help attract them and retain them. Um, what, what you can give staff, I, I always think can be simple things, uh, you know, which actually make it a much nicer environment. I always just give people more time off over Christmas than the most law firms because it was very quiet and you wouldn't get the clients bothering you anyway then. I would always always give people study leave if they were studying for, for Silex qualifications or anything else. I would have staff away days as well every now and then. Um, so for example, once a year, 
I would take the staff to London. We'd go and visit the courts, visit Parliament, see how laws were made and how they were judged. Uh, and obviously, a very important part, we'd obviously go out and see a show on the night and have a nice meal. So it was all a very nice, a nice trip. Um, so these were obviously something that staff really, really enjoyed. And it was obviously an excellent way to, to bond with staff away from the, from the workplace and helps ultimately with retention and making the, you know, the place to work a more pleasant place. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's when, you, when you do have a firm, it's, it's, it's thinking of those simple things that don't cost a fortune, that make staff feel appreciated and happy. Uh, and obviously then that should then translate into them doing a better job and giving better service to the clients, which is what you ultimately want. Um, I've got to mention cash flow. Everybody has, um, but because uh, obviously you will like that when when you set up from from nothing like I did, you'll spend a heck of a lot of money before any money comes in. Uh, like I said, IT, telephone, rent, indemnity, insurance. So it's really vital you've got a budget for that because um, it's mostly bills and no income for for a certain period of time. And obviously, indemnity insurance is one of the the highest costs, um, but certainly. I can highly recommend the company that I use, which was called the professional, or still is called the professional indemnity company, um, which is the pincompany.co.uk. Basically, they do what they they match my values because they treat you like a person, not a number. They're not one of these massive insurers. And actually, when I went to them, they cut my premiums by 60%, which was absolutely amazing. Um, so definitely for the, the business owners or potential business owners out there, I would definitely look them up. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is something I call um, the curse of the self-employed, um, which I'm sure a lot of people will know what this is who work for themselves. But one thing that many people don't consider when setting up in business is that they will ultimately be, be, be responsible for everything from generating work, compliance, finance, insurance, etc. Uh, and you'll never be able to truly switch off, even when on holiday, and you'll often find yourself waking up the night thinking, did I do that on that file or not? Did I do that? And I can't, and not and worrying quite a bit, I think, is, is one of the one of the things that, that you, you ultimately get when you're running your own business. I think it's therefore really important to be able to get away from work and relax and ensure a good work-life balance and find a hobby or a pastime that helps you relax and perhaps even consider um, some coaching as I did, some mentoring so you can have an independent person that you can actually bounce ideas off. I mean, if you get it right, you can find that your time, like it was for me, can be much more flexible and fit your lifestyle actually better than working nine to five, you know, because you can do extra hours, you can pop in on a weekend, you can you can do things that you couldn't do when you're employed. So you can actually get the work done in, in, in times to suit you when you need to. Um, the final thing I really want to mention, which is, um, which seems odd for people thinking of setting up a business, but it is vitally important is, is have an exit strategy. Um, I know, like I said, it's probably a bit odd thinking about the start, but you've really got to think about it. Because if, if like me, you set up a firm and you're a sole principal, um, what do you do with the firm? Um, and more importantly, your files and your clients when you want to close. Obviously, I had this just a few years ago when I closed. Because other firms these days are quite reluctant to purchase another firm because they then become a successor practice which means obviously they get all the work and all the goodwill etc but they also then would take on liability for the old firm for any um, anything you've done wrong in the files so one other option which is the option i use was actually to sell the client files rather than the firm so you can actually get some money to cover the costs because the main cost again coming back to insurance uh, when closing the business is runoff cover which is usually three times your annual premium. So it's quite a hefty chunk <laughs> to, to actually find if you haven't budgeted for it. So that's why it's important to ensure throughout the life of the firm, you give good service and advice, um, you know, to, to lessen the, uh, the, the risk of any potential claims coming through and obviously find the right broker to get the best price for your insurance. Because if you're paying 10,000 pound a year, for the early premium, obviously it's going to be 30. If you can find a broker that cuts that to five, then your, your, your end premium, your exit strategy premium would be would be much, much lower. Um, so definitely have to shop around for that. And definitely I'd recommend that business I mentioned earlier. So hopefully I haven't put anybody off running their own business with, with all of the scary things, but, but it is better to go into these things fully informed. Uh, and obviously the 12 years that I ran my firm was one of the most satisfying times in my career and, and done correctly. Uh, obviously it can be for you too. Thank you.